As far as we know, water is essential for life. Every life form we know about here on Earth needs some amount of water to survive. And so, when we turn our attention to space to look for signs of extraterrestrial life, we start with places that also have water. This ensures at least one of the necessary ingredients for life is present, and it gives us a good starting place for our search. Otherwise, we're just searching for a needle of life in the infinitely large haystack of space. Here, let's take a look at all of the places that we know of water in the solar system, as one of these might well be the best chance we have to find examples of life beyond our own planet. I think in pretty much all of these cases, we wouldn't be talking about complex or intelligent life. We're talking about simple or single-cell organisms. We'd probably have noticed intelligent life in the solar system by now. I mean, there certainly isn't any on Earth. So we're really looking for tiny microbes that may well be found elsewhere in the solar system. Even these tiny life forms would probably need water. So this is still the best place to look for space germs. Obviously, there's loads of water on Earth, but beyond that, we'll start with the closest astronomical body to the Earth, which is the Moon. Sure, there are no rivers, lakes, or oceans on the Moon, but that doesn't mean there's no water there at all. There is still some found on our closest neighbor. Mostly, this water is found near the poles of the Moon, in permanently shadowed craters. And there, it's found in the form of ice. That's right, while not as impressive as our polar ice caps on Earth, at least for now, in shadowy craters of the moon's poles, water ice is found. Wherever the sun hits the moon, ice tends to melt and evaporate away into space. And with no atmosphere on the moon, it gets lost into the abyss for good. Nothing to keep it there and no rain to bring it back down. There is simply no water cycle on the moon. Some analysis of soil from sunlit regions also suggests trace amounts of water molecules in these sunnier areas too, although that is only in very low concentrations. Whether any of this is enough water or in a useful form for microbes is unlikely to be honest, but it gives us clues that water has been on the moon for a long time, maybe even since the moon first formed. And so, in theory, there could be the possibility of fossilized microbes from the past, even if there's no life there now. It might not be likely, but I think it is possible, so it's worth exploring. So, despite having many places on the moon called seas, like the Sea of Tranquility, where we first landed on the moon, that's not because there was actually water covering the moon. Rather, it just looked a bit like a sea from here when we named it a few hundred years ago. So sea by name, but definitely not by nature. The next place to discuss water is the red planet Mars. Notice we're pretty much skipping Mercury and Venus, the other mostest closest planets to us. Those planets are incredibly hot and are pelted with all sorts of solar radiation that tends to strip water off into space. Now, both could have hosted a lot of water in the past, brought to them on asteroids or produced from chemistry on the planets themselves. This would probably be in the form of some sort of outgassing from the cores, but both of the planets seem to have lost almost all of that water. Mercury, surprisingly, might have a little bit of ice in the permanently shadowed craters at its poles, just like the moon. Venus likely had a lot of water a long time ago, but we don't have tons of evidence that either planet retains a lot, beyond maybe some polar ice. Venus could have some water vapor in its thick, thick atmosphere, but I haven't seen too many studies suggesting that there's loads of it, so we'll move on from that pretty quickly. The other conditions, like temperature and pressure, also make these planets a little bit harder to explore and imagine life on. So for this discussion, we'll skip straight to Mars. Just like the Moon, most of Mars's water is tied up in polar ice caps, permafrost in the shadowy regions of Mars's poles. The red planet has a thin and quite feeble atmosphere, but even that does contain a small amount of water vapor too. Even more surprising is the fact that Mars may well have huge subsurface reservoirs of water. Seismic data from NASA's InSight lander, which measured Mars quakes to study the composition of the planet, suggests there could be quite a lot of water between 10 and 20 kilometers below the surface. In the past, Mars had huge oceans and rivers, and while most of that has been lost to space over time, it seems like there still could be quite a lot of water locked under the surface. There is even evidence of water being visible as dark streaks on the Martian surface, in places where the temperature drops low enough that it doesn't immediately evaporate. All in all, plenty of water, but as yet no evidence of life on Mars. It's also currently the only planet entirely inhabited by robots, but the search for biological life there continues. Now, from a planet to a dwarf planet, we have the object that spawned the word asteroid. 
That object is called Ceres. It lives in the asteroid belt with millions of other rocky minor planets. But Ceres is the largest object in the belt, so that's where we're heading. We think Ceres contains a lot of water, and in fact, its composition could be as much as 25 or 30% water. So that's quite a lot. The analysis we've been able to do on this asteroid suggests that water ice is mixed in with the rocks on Ceres' surface. And in a few rare cases, there was exposed ice found too, and even the occasional plume of water erupting from Ceres. The amount of water is inferred from maps of where hydrogen is on the asteroid, and then using models to get a distribution of water from that. One of the leading theories of how we got so much water on Earth is that it arrived on asteroids impacting our planet. And while we don't have confirmation of this, expect many, many asteroids in the asteroid belt to also contain an incredible amount of water, just like Ceres. Now, let's move even further away. We get to Jupiter, and to be honest, more excitingly here, the Jovian moons. Now, Jupiter has a lot of moons. As I'm recording this, it has 95 recognized moons. That is a testament to how large Jupiter is and how much gravity it exerts. Just imagine if the Earth had 95 moons, the night sky would be full. Now, most of the moons of Jupiter are really small, and we don't know or care tons about them, to be honest, but some of them are really impressive. In particular, three of the largest moons, Callisto, Ganymede, and especially Europa. We're pretty sure that these moons all have enormous subsurface oceans. We think life on Earth first developed in the deep ocean near vents, spewing out tasty minerals into the water. Therefore, finding other places in the solar system where these same conditions might be realized is very exciting and enticing. It's the reason that as we speak, both NASA and the European Space Agency each have missions on their way to the Jovian moons in the form of NASA's Europa Clipper and ESA's JUICE missions. This means that in the not too distant future, we should know a lot more about each of these watery moons. The next spot where water is found in the solar system is near the most beautiful planet of them all, Saturn. The planet itself, like Jupiter before it, is a gas giant, and we don't know for sure if water or solid ice could be found within the planet, where a solid core is presumably hidden beneath the gas. There does seem to be some water vapor deeper in the planet's atmosphere, but the really exciting places in the Saturnian system are the rings, and even more so, the moon Enceladus. The rings are almost entirely made of ice, but Enceladus is very active and interesting. It has so much water below the surface, and it is constantly spraying water out into space. In fact, this recent JWST image can even show the sprays, and there now seems to be a torus of water vapor around Saturn as a result. That is a lot of water with a lot of potential. Even further from us, we reach the ice giants. Once again, we have many moons with potential subsurface oceans. Around Uranus, we have Ariel, Umbriel, Miranda, Titania, and Oberon, all likely to have subsurface oceans. And Neptune's largest moon, Triton, also probably has water below the surface. Now, these planets are absurdly far away, and so are very difficult to study in depth. No probe has gone that far since Voyager 2, which launched back in August 1977, and it didn't even reach the icy giants until the mid and late 80s. There is also nothing concrete in the works to go back to these systems, so it could be a long time before we can study them up close again, and learn more about these worlds in the detail that all of us astronomers want. Elsewhere in the solar system, even the little planet that couldn't, Pluto, looks likely to have some subsurface water, so plutonium life isn't totally out of the question yet either. The travelers of the solar system, comets, are also often made up of water, sometimes 50% or more, but that can vary quite a lot. Hopefully, as you can see, water is pretty much everywhere, even in unlikely locations around the solar system. Life is absolutely not guaranteed where we find water. But as far as we know, everywhere there's life, water is required. You could say that for all life we know about, which is just here on Earth, water is a necessary but not sufficient condition for life. If you did a maths degree like I did, that's how you sometimes think about these things. It's a bit silly, but I kind of like it. This also certainly isn't an exhaustive list either. Many more outer moons comprise of at least some water, and there might well be evidence for water on other bodies that I haven't covered in this video. Leave me any questions and comments you have down below. Tell me where you'd most expect to or hope to find water. Let me know if you think I missed any outer space oases that you think I should have covered in this video, and subscribe if you're not yet. It would really help me out a ton. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye!